Hey, thanks everybody for joining us today at Sunnyside. It's class day again. Today is Colorful Shrubs. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager. Nicole's back there in the background. Good morning. Yeah. Hope everybody's enjoying their Sunday morning here. We uh, hopefully won't have a frost tonight. It's awful cold. It's awful windy. But I promise you, spring is here in some extent. I still have my shorts on today if you were driving, joining us yesterday. So, so uh, we refuse to believe it's not spring. It's here. But uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to go fast and furious, just like we always do in these classes and try to cover a lot of subjects. Um, I'll share a little slideshow with you. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about a couple things before we start. Maybe a couple disclaimers. Um, you know, we do a lot of classes here at Sunnyside, which I love. Those include hydrangeas, roses, rhododendron classes coming up in a couple weeks. Um, so there's some things that I won't talk a lot about because we have specific classes on those. So this is kind of a fun class for me <clears throat> to maybe show you a lot of other shrubs we can utilize in the landscape uh, besides the main uh, main Northwest kind of staples that we use in our yards here. Um, second thing is, you know, just to make sure everybody understands, <clears throat> you know, basically sometimes we have some new gardeners joining us, obviously some experienced ones as well. But we're going to talk a lot about evergreen and deciduous, just to make sure that everybody knows when I say the word deciduous means I lose my leaves in the winter, I turn pretty color, and I will leaf back out the next spring. So a lot of our deciduous shrubs are in the process of waking back up right now for another season of garden. Um, a lot of the deciduous stuff will give us spring color foliage, fall color foliage, and some, some winter interest a lot of times. The evergreens obviously will keep their leaves, but also quite a few I'll talk about have variegation, new growth color, maybe turn a color in the winter, but don't drop their leaves. So keep that in mind too. Uh, we can have some excellent shrubs that are evergreen and still offer us both flower um, and some nice foliage color as well. Um, let's go start the slideshow here. You gotta give me a minute, the sun came out and now the screen is blinding me. Just one second here. So there we go. Yes, I found my cursor finally. Okay, so there's our, there's me in case you forgot already. But, um, you know, we always have fun at the classes at Sunnyside. So hopefully have a little fun today. You know, get your shrub on. You know, this is the, we're going to talk about spring and summer bloomers. You'll see in the, the pictures and the slides I'll show kind of a spring for sun, spring for shade, summer for sun, summer for shade. Um, and then also some foliage stuff at the end as well. You know, again, keep in mind that evergreen versus deciduous, everything in your yard doesn't have to keep its leaves or the evergreen state, but we have plenty of plants that, that do keep their foliage from conifers to, to obviously lots of shrubs. Have some deciduous as well. Those are the things that bring you that seasonal interest uh, that we typically take advantage of. You know, for me, you know, flowers come and go. I'm always about foliage color, contrast, structure. You know, don't think of it just as, oh, I like, red flowers or pink flowers or white flowers, but what else does that plant do? You know, flowers are gonna kind of come and go, but what are you left with the rest of the season with that shrub? Something that you like the foliage of, you like the shape of, does it fit the right spot in your yard? You know, which kind of leads us to that big thing, you know, the right shrub and the right place for this class. So, you know, getting the right choice for you, your maintenance needs, your soil conditions, your light, all those different things that we wanna have the right plant in the right place so you succeed long term. You know, sun versus shade versus partial sun. You know, that's always kind of a, a nebulous topic. I think everybody knows when they have deep dark shade or hot baking sun all day, it's kind of those tweener spots that are sometimes tough. So kind of think of those part shade things um, to shade or things that we can have with morning sun and some afternoon sun protection um, usually will work quite, a, quite well with most of the shade plants we talk about. Full sun will be the opposite. We don't have to have sun from, you know, 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. here when we have our long days in early summer. But if we have that afternoon sun, the, the good portion of the day uh, will give us all the structure. Um, you know, think of the shrubs, you know, kind of not to turn this into landscape design class, but, but uh, you know, think of your shrubs as kind of the backbones in the garden. You know, we want foundation plants. Sometimes we want a single specimen. Sometimes we need something low that will have some presence on the border. You know, I like probably all of you, you know, love a mixture in our yard from tree to shrub to perennial to some annuals for, for summer color. You know, when the perennials are gone and not, nothing's left much in the winter, 
you know, what do you have to look at? You know, have some deciduous plants for some structure and presence. You know, have a cool specimen evergreen that will catch your eye. Um, so kind of think of those three levels or layers in your garden, which is kind of that next point. You know, look at the heights, look at the colors. You can contrast so easily, you know, a little dwarf red barberry up against something green or something variegated with yellow foliage up against something green. You know, that's going to look good um, all through the growing season. And in the case of evergreens, all through the winter as well. You know, play with the different leaf sizes, different contrast, different colors. And then the flowers are a nice bonus. You know, we can always pick something that, that uh, blooms as well. You know, get Twiggy with it. That's my favorite t-shirt around here. We got a great uh, partner, Bailey Nurseries, that sent us some fun t-shirts and get Twiggy with it is my favorite. Um, you know, what kind of shape and structure are you looking for? Do you need something low, bushy, something you can shear perhaps? Do you want something that's taller, narrower? Do you want something kind of nice base shape? You know, there's a lot of different, you know, kind of structures we can get with our shrubs and, and prune for that as well. But kind of ask yourself maybe that question for you before you make your choice. You know, do you want something that grows really fast? Are you trying to block the, block the neighbor, block the garbage can, you know, hide the window view, you know, whatever it is, you know, do you want something that grows a little faster that maybe you can attain some, some size to it a little quicker? Or do you want something kind of slow and steady? You know, I'm a, I'm a slow and steady guy myself. I like to watch them grow and things kind of inch up every season, but certainly it's your yard, you know, pick what kind of works for you. You know, one big thing for me is, you know, think about the pruning aspect of this. Are you going to prune it or are you not going to prune it? And how much time are you going to want to spend to prune it? You know, a lot of things can be sheared. Other things don't look quite as nice, I think, if they're sheared. So kind of make your choice a little bit. Boy, is that something I have to prune once a year, every other year, twice a year? You know, the plant will, will help dictate that and certainly the location in your yard. But kind of think of, again, some of these questions before you make your choice. You know, big one with me, if you go to my pruning classes is kind of knowing where your plants, do they bloom on old wood or new wood? You know, that's gonna dictate again, the pruning timing and probably how far you can cut these things back. So, you know, think of, you know, think of, of those, of, again, that, that question as you're buying it, boy, is that something that grows up with new growth, sets flower buds and I instantly get flower every season? Or is that something I can't touch much in the winter because the flower buds are already on from last year that I get to enjoy this coming season. So that, that's kind of the two extremes. You know, one big thing up here is it's raining today. We had a wet winter um, is drainage. You know, make sure you, you consider your soil. Hard pan clay is not gonna make a lot of plants happy. There's some things that will thrive, you know, on a wetter, heavier soil that we carry. Selection will be very limited. You know, other plants we wanna make sure we have adequate drainage and don't get too wet in the winter. You know, some things root very shallow, you know, shallow are, are rhododendrons, azaleas, some plants like that don't need, you know, three foot of loose soil to, to grow on. It can be much, much shallower of an area where other things we need to have a, a nice deep hole that the water again will not accumulate over the winter months. You know, and finally, like all the classes, you know, I'll probably show you some stuff obviously I like around here, um, but it's your yard, you know, get what you like just because I say, this is a great plant. Everybody should have one. Doesn't mean it maybe, I know what, I don't really like that. Well, that's great. You know, we'll hopefully find something that kind of catches your eye because this is all about what you want uh, to have in your yard for shrubs. Now, a couple places I might look at, you know, we've got a great website. We've got a lot of information. Um, you know, we have a lot of the specialty shrub sections on there. We don't really have a, a shrub section that would show all of this today. You know, this is recorded. You can go back and look at some pictures if you like. Um, later if we don't catch them all um, but look at some websites there's some great information online a lot of the growers that we utilize are some of the best in the country like monrovia like bailey you know there's a couple of of suggestions right there of places you can go on as a homeowner look at selections look at eight nine different varieties of one plant find the one that works for you the growth habit the color the size all those things and and then help make your choice you know then you email sunny cider or call us and say, hey, do you carry this plant from Monrovia or do you carry this plant from Bailey? You know, and sometimes we may not, but it's something we can certainly look into to bring it in for you as well. You know, we'll start off kind of, like I said, we'll do this in kind of four easy sections, but spring bloomers for sunny areas. Again, afternoon sunspots or all day sunspots. These are plants that are gonna take a little bit more sun and a little bit more heat. You'll see, I put three on there right off the bat. You know, our rhododendron azalea class, 
comes up in two weeks. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about those. Probably the best spring blooming shrubs you can get for sun and some for shade as well. Uh, camellias are in full bloom right now. That's another one we deal with a little bit in other classes, but those are three great Pacific Northwest staple shrubs. Everybody should probably have some in their yard and there's a lot of selection as far as variety and colors and growth habits. Now, if we look at some other spring blooming things, some of you may have these in your yard, some others may go, ooh, I haven't ever seen one of those. But um, these are all great choices, I think, that we could utilize in sunny areas uh, for, for some spring bloom. You know, California lilac or ceanothus, it's not a lilac, it's a different plant than everybody thinks of as a lilac, but that's always probably one of the, the, the easiest plant for us to get blue flowers from. Light blue, medium blue, dark purple blue, lots of different varieties on those but a really good drought tolerant selection for full sun, always kind of blooms, great one for the pollinators. Yes, we got super cold this winter and yes, mine got a little bit of tip damage uh, from the cold weather, but this is an easy one to prune back lightly in spring and this blooms on new wood. So the growth comes right up, boom, we get our blue flower still, maybe a little bit later in May, June versus that April, May time, but we'll still get our flowers on it. Uh, we've got some beautiful ceanothus in right now that are, that, are, that are blooming already. Flowering currant, you know, is a native type shrub up here in the Pacific Northwest. One of the best early bloomers for hummingbirds. If you like to keep the hummers happy with some natural nectar, uh, flowering currant is a nice sized deciduous plant, nice yellow fall color, really bright, bright flowers. These are all in bloom right now, usually starting up here in that mid late March time frame. And they'll go into later April, early May, depending on, on how old yours is. It's a great shrub that can be pruned. You know, this is an old wood bloomer. We would prune this after bloom, let it grow up, and then we'll be ready to go for, for 2023. Uh, but certainly a nice specimen uh, shrub that we can go in that sun or park shade area. Uh, it's a great one for the wildlife. A regular lilacs, I kind of kept on a separate stage so this slide so we didn't get too confused. But, you know, these are all of our traditional super fragrant, you know, late April, May into June blooming lilacs. We've got a lot of choices and singles and doubles, different colors. You know, typical French lilacs, what we call Syringa vulgaris, are gonna be really tall. You know, that's not a plant I would recommend buying and trying to prune into a little four foot meatball. I've seen it done uh, in some yards. And again, it's your yard if you wanna do it. But typically, this is more of a tree, you know, a three, four, five trunks that'll get up some height. Maybe it's 10 feet, maybe it's 12. You know, my yard's uh, going on 50 years, an old house. I've been there 20. You know, my lilacs are up there 15 feet tall, and I love them. So they're trees that I have gardens underneath. Um, there's other lilacs, like Korean varieties. There's some great new re-blooming type lilacs. Uh, that come out like blue meringue is a great choice. We have a lot of dwarf ones like that. If you don't want the 10 or 12 feet, let's get something a little smaller that might stay more in the five to six foot range and be much bushier and easier to manage it for size, okay? Still fragrant, still lilacs, but uh, you've got some options there. Uh, mock orange is a great old fashioned plant. Again, heavy fragrance, always white flowers. Um, this is single or double. You can kind of see from that picture, you know, really heavy bloom, usually May into June, kind of long arching stems. You know, old mock orange was a massive plant. You know, that's a big plant up there, 12 or 15 feet tall. If you got an old shrub and you don't prune it, there's some great dwarfish ones in now. You know, we typically carry uh, mock orange that stays more like six feet tall. We would have some things like Snow White. If you looked on the Bailey website that I mentioned earlier, we carry all of their first editions mock oranges much more manageable size with the same great fall color. They're deciduous that we would have our great fragrant white flowers either in, either in single or double. You know, a couple evergreens, you know, here's some things that will keep their leaves in the winter. You know, Osmanthus is in bloom right now. It's got a nice little sweet smell to it. Um, that's a great clipped plant, an easy one to shear. I can make a hedge out of that. I could turn it into a triangle, a meatball, a square, whatever your thing is. Uh, that's an easy prune. It's kind of like boxwood a little bit, but a little darker green, and you would always get that really nice white fragrant flower in spring, which you would not get on the boxwood. So uh, Osmanthus is a pretty useful plant. We, this is something we, we typically have around as well. Uh, Pieris, 
you know, it's kind of with our roadie Azalea. I don't usually uh, talk about Paris much in the roadie class. So I thought we mentioned it here. You know, look at your options. A lot of people call these Lily of the Valley shrubs. Um, you know, it's a plant from Japan, Japanese Pieris. It's got a bunch of common names. Andromeda is another one I've heard of. But the point is with Pieris, I've got a lot of really good choices. And this is a great shrub to me for the variation in flower, in growth habit, and in leaf color. This is a picture of a variegated one here. That's awful pretty. Uh, called Passion Frost. We can have white flower. We can have pink or we can have red. We can have variegated. We can have green. And we can have dwarf, you know, something that just gets two or three feet tall, or we can have some old fashioned ones that might get eight or 10 feet tall when they get old. So depending on your yard, picking the right shrub for the right place, we'll have a plant in there that will thrive for years and give you the look you're looking for. The one thing with Pieris, you know, to me, it's the flower early spring, but we also get some beautiful new growth colors. So the Pieris we carry, not only nice flowering, but you know, I'm looking for an, an added an added season of interest with that leaf. So we would have things like flaming silver comes out beautiful, bright pink new leaves. Forest flame, kind of an orangey color. Mountain fires, red. Katsura is one that comes out with a deep purple. So yes, I get bloom, get those flowers cut back, or let the new growth come up. And then I also have another month, six weeks of beautiful leaf color interest on top um, of the flowers as well. You know, a couple of more deciduous staples here. You know, I love spirea. That's an old fashioned plant. It's really easy to grow. This is one that we can shear. We don't have to be so special with pruning. I'll give you a trick. If you have spirea, let it bloom in spring, shear it back below the flowers. You'll get new fresh growth come up and a whole nother flower for that summer fall time. So I prune my spirea going into the spring let it do its thing and bloom. And I'll go back out in, in later May and early June, shear it back, get all those pretty leaves up again, and then a whole other set of flower uh, to enjoy later in the season. Lots of spireas. I mean, I can go green, I can go lime, I can go orangey, I can go red, um, and I can pick some different color flowers, whites, pinks, and reds as well. Um, there's certainly a really easy spirea for most anybody's yard to grow. I mean, that's an, that's an easy kind of bulletproof plant. Keep it watered. They like some water. They don't mind having a little bit of drainage issues. This is one that will take a little bit more wet, some of the some more so than other shrubs, but a, a very, very easy thing to grow. Um, certainly right now, <laughs> if you came down to Sunnyside, this is a plant you'd look out at the spirea table and say, wow, look at all the colors out there because they have beautiful spring leaf, nice bloom, and then again, gorgeous fall color before they, they drop their foliage. Uh, viburnums. It's probably a class we could entertain having a class on just viburnum someday because there is a lot of really cool viburnums out there, whether evergreen, deciduous. This particular picture is, is of what we call double file viburnum. That's a big, large grower. You kind of get those white lace cap flowers all along the branches, you know, grows up good eight feet by eight feet, maybe even wider as you get an old one. Yes, they can be pruned. But look at your options. I mean, from snowball bush, we get those big white kind of snowball flowers. My two sons love beating on those in the yard with the wiffle ball bat. You got things like double file viburnum. We have some fragrant ones like Burke Woody Eye. I've got some of those around, Korean spice viburnum. Uh, some tall ones that even bloom in the winter, like Pink Dawn is one we talked about in our winter interest class as well. Um, lots of good lots of good foliage excellent fall color on the whole viburnum group some of them get berries and you've always got a really nice flower uh, to enjoy as well a couple more spring bloomers you know dutzia is kind of another old-fashioned shrub maybe old old-fashioned dutzia not much people have any more to sell but a lot of the new hybrids um, a have really nice flowering but also have some great foliage you know there's some fun options now again not just for the bloom but to get a really cool fa uh, a foliage color as well. That picture right there is one called Chardonnay Pearls. It would have the nice white, you know, kind of little pearly flowers with that limey green yellow foliage. That stays really attractive even after it blooms. Then those turn would turn pretty color and then drop their leaves for the winter. Uh, forsythias, one that's already bloomed out. I think the forsythias are <clears throat> excuse me, just about done. But forsythia is always going to be yellow. 
and it's always going to give me that one of the first shrubs to bloom every spring kind of those in the quince will be coming up here in a minute but the forsythia is one you know big long arching stems don't be bashful on pruning back your forsythia that's a plant that blooms on last year's wood so after it blooms i could substantially cut those back we'll say i could probably break my pruning rules of one third and the forsythia is always going to shoot new stems back up as long as i leave that new wood alone as it comes on in later spring and summer that will give me my flower for 2023 so keep that in mind old wood bloomer but something we can certainly maintain if we let forsythia go and you've got room great you know, an old forsythia is a big plant but it's certainly one that we could tame a little bit as well with some pruning a couple really fun ones uh, both these would be evergreens again so this is mexican orange or choicea um, you know, again, to be all honest, I have this in my yard. Mine got dipped a little bit with the frost. I've seen a lot of people bring in uh, pictures this winter. We got cold enough here after Christmas down into the single digits that some of these got damaged. Don't throw them in the compost yet. They can be cut back. They'll reflush up. They bloom on the new wood. So it should be back to shape. Yes, some of them will have to get cut back more than others to recover, but I would try cutting it back crossing your fingers and toes, throwing some food on it before you, before you gave up and walked away. But Mexican orange is a good evergreen. We can do it in sun, park shade. Um, this particular one is called Sundance. It would give me the yellow to limey colored foliage. We have dark green ones. We also have the new cut leaf ones like Aztec pearl and gold fingers. Those would have narrower foliage, a little bit different texture, but the same thing. I could choose a dark green or I could go with something that's more yellow in line. All of them are always gonna have that white, citrusy, fragrant flower. And that typically appears in that, you know, again, May to June time frame. maybe a little bit later this year if we have to cut ours back like mine, but uh, certainly something that you, you will smell out in the landscape as well. Uh, I think mountain laurel on the, on the right there, uh, we call that calmia with a K. I think mountain laurel is one of the prettiest flowers in nature. If you look at that thing, that doesn't look real. Sometimes I think people see these flowers and think that's something fake, you know, a little cut flower or something from an arrangement. Uh, there is a huge assortment of really cool varieties of mountain laurel in. We've got probably 10 or 12 in the stock right now. These bloom into May, into June, uh, grow a little bit like rhododendrons, not quite as big. Um, but these will take a lot more dry for one than a roadie would. It would take a lot more sun than some of the roadies as well. This is a plant we would kind of find um, on the sunny, you know, kind of drier slopes over on the other side of the, of the U.S. and the Appalachians and some on the East Coast. Um, they're plenty hardy enough to grow anywhere around here, but very intricate flowers. If you see that picture, typically you're going to pick a calmia that has a bud color, white, pink, or red. And then when it opens, how much banding and striping and spotting do you like? Because there's some pretty fun uh, varieties of calmia out there if you want to come down and take a look. A couple old fashioned plants. <clears throat> I should have taken pearl bush off the slideshow because I don't have any yet. We're still hoping for a few, but that's an interesting kind of old deciduous plant that gets large. It's called Exocharda, one of the few things with an X in it. Um, if you will look it up, it's E-X-O-C-H-O-R-D-A. Um, that's a fun old fashioned thing that literally looks like a string of pearls when it's in bud and the flowers open to white kind of in progression, a little cluster flower that hangs down. Um, it's certainly a fun plant to have. It would be a, you know, kind of a specimen shrub. It is deciduous, doesn't keep its leaves, um, but certainly something fun for, for springtime bloom. I hope we'll still be able to have a few in. We had some on order that got canceled, but uh, we'll, we'll still be looking for some here to have at Sunnyside. Uh, quince is in bloom right now. Mine on my bank is going crazy with flowers. You know, I can get quince in whites, pinks, reds, peaches, oranges, you know, kind of any of those color tones. Um, we tend to carry the newer style quinces here, the double take series um, that would be orange, peach, pink, or red. Um, they have a little less thorns. Quince, old fashioned quince sometimes has some pretty good sized thorns on it. You got to get some body armor on to get out there and do the pruning. Uh, but a lot of the new ones are a little less thorny and frankly, a little tidier to grow too. Um, you know, give some room to quince. This is one you, you're you going to have to tell to behave a little bit. It likes to sucker a little bit. It likes to spread a little bit. So give it some room to grow or make sure you're 
signing up for a little bit of pruning um, and maintenance to keep it contained in an area. A couple of really fun shrubs I wish people bought more of, to be honest with you. Uh, Sweet Spire, I think, is a great plant. I think we call this Itea, I-T-E-A. Uh, there's some great new varieties of Itea out there. You know, this is one that we could grow in some wetter soil, some heavier soil, some bad conditions, honestly, and it would still thrive. Um, these have super fragrant white flowers you can see in the picture there, and those are stunning in the fall. That's one of the top red orange fall color shrubs i think on the property uh, we sell a few every year and i keep thinking more and more people will go well, i gotta try one of those because it's very easy to grow um, and i think again you get multiple seasons of interest out of it something easy easy to plant in the yard on the the other side there i'll smile most of us call this wiglia because uh, it's more fun to say but it, it's really white this is another old fashioned plan. I can remember my grandma having one in her yard that looked covered about half her house. There's a lot of new varieties of Wygelia out in the last decade or so, um, you know, that we carry here. We have a lot of flavors of this. They're becoming more popular. Great flower colors, great for hummingbirds. That's a perfect color and a size for a hummingbird to get some nectar. We can do whites, light pink. There's a lot of options for like a hotter pink to red flower. The big things with me, the difference on Wygelia is a much tidier growth habit. There's a lot of low ones for borders, medium sized shrubs. We don't have to have, you know, giant old Wygelia like it used to be 30 years ago and foliage color. You know, we can get dark black purples. We have variegated ones, some really interesting, even gold foliage Wygelia with the red flower is super striking. You know, we can get a lot of fun uh, Wygelia flavors. We have most of these in stock now. Um, the other thing is, look, on Wygelia, there's quite a few that will re-bloom now. And that, to me, is a huge deal in the shrub world. You know, we do this with a lot of other plants that will bloom in spring, grow up, and then re-bloom again. And there's a number of Wygelias, the, the Sonic Bloom series. Uh, we get one called Crimson Kisses. There's quite a few varieties you'll find now to give you a big flower display again in May, wait another six, eight weeks, they grow up a little bit of fresh foliage and then boom, they'll rebud and flower again. So again, longer blooming season always works for me as a gardener, I'm sure it does for you too. Um, now we get into kind of more of the shady situations um, and it doesn't necessarily mean deep dark shade. Like I said earlier, a lot of these can have morning sun. See how we're doing on time morning sun and then a little bit of afternoon sun protection perhaps or the opposite i've got shade all day and then i just have a little bit late in the afternoon to evening that's fine as well too you know we've got a lot of daphne options up here that's daphne odora that would bloom in spring coming out of winter super fragrant a lot of variegated leaves on those if we look at lukotha way this doesn't have a very good common name so lukotha way is lukotha way some people call it fetter bush which i think is harder to remember than the Cothaway. But the big thing with the Cothaway, nice spring bloom, but great foliage. You know, that's a great evergreen that we talked earlier that turns color in the fall for the winter, but doesn't drop its leaves. You know, that's a great native type shrub that we can use in a lot of different spots in the yard. You know, Oregon grapes, a great native, and that is starting to bloom right now. Great one for the hummingbirds again, nice, easy spring bloom. And if you wanted to stay you know, Pacific Northwest native, Oregon grape is native. We get a lot of hybrids of that, but we do carry uh, native type Oregon, Oregon grapes as well. You know, Sarka Coca is one we talked about in our winter class a little bit. Those are just about done blooming now, but if I wanted something fragrant and white and evergreen, we've got a few different choices for growth habits on Sarka Coca. That's a great shade filler plant. I have those at my house. I think most gardeners have discovered that they call sweet box. You know, that's an easy, easy plant to grow <clears throat> in a low light situation or part sun that is evergreen and does give me a really nice kind of late winter into mid spring uh, fragrant flower display. Winter hazel, excuse me, winter hazel is in bloom right here at the nursery right now. I'm not witch hazel, this is a little bit different. They call this cordialopsis. And winter hazel, we can get tall ones. We can get a little bit shorter one called buttercup. <clears throat> this is one we'd always have 
kind of a night's arching habit and we'd have that really easy, reliable yellow bloom right before the leaves come out for springtime. Uh, we have some skimmia. You know, that's kind of another old fashioned evergreen. <clears throat> They're always attractive and bloom in the late winter. Just keep in mind with skimmia, we have he's and we have she's. And if I want the berries, I have to have he and she do their thing. And then I get the berries on the she part of that plant. So if you don't want the berries, just get a couple males. They got a nice flower, nice foliage, easy to grow. <clears throat> if you want to add a cluster of those red berries on there, after bloom in the summer and the fall, then make sure you get a female and a male and the female will get the berry interest as well. I put one picture of a camellia on there, I couldn't resist, but don't forget camellias, you know, a lot of great spring blooming camellias. We still got quite a few around here. Um, yes, yeah, some of the flowers get frosted, especially the white ones if they bloom real early, but uh, there's quite a bit that bloom a little bit later um, and a couple of flowers here and there that they get frosted, there's still more buds to replace them. So they'll, they'll still keep going. Um, there's another one on the right there, Father Gilla. That's another one I wish more people discovered. Um, that's a really pretty shrub that looks a little on the native side, but it's very manageable. Uh, it's got excellent fall color. That's one of the top plants, I think, for fall color. But most people don't notice the nice, fragrant little white flower spikes that we get in May and June. You know, this is a plant we always have a few of around. We can't ever get a lot of them, but certainly one I think more gardeners I wish would discover because it's a really easy plant that we can grow, honestly, in more sun um, than even shade or part shade areas, and they'll, they'll do very, very well. Well, if we look at summer bloomers uh, real quick, we'll start moving faster. I'm never going to finish in an hour, Nicole. But summer bloomers, again, I'm going to skip roses and hydrangeas. We have specific classes. Uh, coming up on those in May. We also do another hydrangea class in the summer, um, but you are never going to beat a rose for all summer bloom and sun, and you're not going to beat PG hydrangea for all summer through fall bloom in, in, in the sun as well. Now, not round flower. When we say PG hydrangea, we're talking about the cone or panicle type hydrangeas. Those will take a lot of heat. They need water, but they'll take the heat and not burn out in full sun location. So so those two will be coming up. If we look at some others, Abelia is a great plant that blooms typically up here more mid to late summer, but it's got great foliage. There's some awesome uh, varieties of Abelia out there for the gardeners these days. Uh, that's one called Magic Daydream with the pink, the white, the green. We get Kaleidoscope if you like the hot colors like me, the oranges and the yellows and lime greens. Uh, there's a lot of options for good Abelias. Yes, this is an evergreen. Typically this winter up here, we got cold enough where most of them defoliated or partially defoliated, but leafing right back out and off we go now for another season. Uh, butterfly bush we'll have in here pretty quick, just like it is a plant for the butterflies, fragrant flower spikes, great for the pollinators. The difference up here in Washington is we can't have old fashioned butterfly bush. Those are illegal, the ones that produce seed. So if you come to Sunnyside here in a couple of weeks and through most of the summer, we'll have a pretty good selection of a lot of dwarf ones and some taller ones to add to the garden, but these would not produce seeds. So we're able to sell them to you. You're not gonna have to worry about volunteers popping up all over the place uh, when, when they do go into bloom. So, so don't keep in mind butterfly bush. We'll have the buzz series in, which is all different colors in the rainbow. You get named colors and those are much smaller, like three or four feet tall. And we'll have some taller ones like Miss Molly, Miss Ruby, Miss Violet. They got kind of funny names. Um, it's, a, it's a weird plant these days because I'll tell you when you look at them, ask if you don't find them here at Sunnyside. Most of the growers now call these nectar bush <clears throat> or summer lilac, which drives me crazy. The flower looks a little like a lilac, but it's still budly, a butterfly bush when it comes down to it. Uh, crepe myrtles. You know, up until the last couple of years with global warming, I probably would not have mentioned many crepe myrtles, but I think we get warm enough now in the summer months that we will get reliable bloom on these. I've had friends that have had one for 15 years and never seen a flower. Now it's been two straight summers, like, yes, the crepe myrtle bloomed again. So look at some crepe myrtles. It's a really pretty plant, usually more in the southeast U.S., where it's a little more hot and humid, but it's a pretty plant up here. 
if it blooms awesome but even if it was just the foliage it's got really cool bark on it would make an attractive specimen in our landscape and if it blooms great you know you can pick a lot of different colors again a lot of different growth habits look at your options monrovia would be a great website to go explore crepe myrtles they had carry a lot of varieties and a lot of different sizes um if you wanted to kind of see what's out there we will have uh, quite a few varieties in here pretty quick not just yet i would guess late april early may we'll start to have a lot of crepe myrtles uh, into the summer months as well escalonia on the right there i almost took it off the show this year but i'll leave it on um you know i don't know that there's an escalonia left anywhere in our little corner of the world that did not get fried this winter you know we cannot have you know teens and single digits on escalonia either they got nipped back on the tip foliage i've seen plenty of a good gardening customers bring in pictures of their escalonia in the last two months that is dead to the ground yes we're going to cut it off yes we'll cross our fingers and hopefully it will get going again a lot of times they will plants are resilient um, but that's just an fyi if i live right in the water probably wouldn't worry about it if i'm up in the mountains you know escalonia may not be the best choice as a, as a summer shrub um, they're great for pollinators they don't take a lot of water you know they're easy to clip there's a lot of good traits about escalonia but just be careful with the with the hardiness a little bit you know there's hebes that's exactly the same story as i just said you know i'm a hebe lover i think i'm probably going to be down about five hebes in my own yard in everett after this winter but i'm crossing my fingers and hopefully they'll come back out i prune them back um you know there are some hardier hebes there's a lot of hebes i see that nurseries carry that have no chance to grow up here. So be really careful when you choose a Hebe for your yard, look at the zone hardiness. I would never touch zone eight, zone seven, you're taking a chance. There are a couple that are down there to zone six, like Sutherlandii is the one on the, that I put a picture of there, a nice bluish leaf with the white flower. That one would be a little bit more, uh, more durable. And again, for the hydrangea class, there's a picture of a PG just so everybody kind of knows, not our round blue flowers, but tall, Cone flowers, white, light pink to red as the summer goes on. But that's something you're going to get a great summer to fall uh, full of flowers on any of the varieties of PG. Rock roses, you know, are just going to start blooming here. A nice little drought tolerant one again up in the hills, not as much, but down towards the water, a pretty easy one to grow. <clears throat> Be careful of the hardiness. And those you want in hot bacon, sun, and dry, that's a great option sometimes for you know, curb plantings, um, you know, areas that you don't get to water quite as much. Rock rose may be an option for that for you. Um, put beautyberry on there. You know, that's the berry. So that picture would be more like in September, you know, late, late summer, but those do bloom in the summertime. So we get a nice little flower on there. And then we develop a really attractive kind of metallic purple berry on Japanese beautyberry. You know, that's a tall deciduous plant. Give it some room to grow. Um, those are spectacular in the landscape heading into the summer and the fall. But, you know, I'm going to end up with a six, eight foot tall, you know, kind of an arching shape to it with more than one stem. So just make sure we give that one a little bit of room. Uh, Caryopteris is a little, little short deciduous plant. You know, that's a nice blue flower source up here. They love hot and they love dry. That's one you cannot get too wet. It's a great little kind of shrub or shrublet, we'll call it that you can mix in with perennials and things in a butterfly garden, nice little cottage garden to give you some blue. Yes, they're woody, they lose their leaves, they look like a deciduous shrub, but they never get very tall. You know, Caryopteris is something I would never expect to get more than two or three feet tall in a season. It's one we can also cut back coming out of winter to keep it smaller and let it start over again every season. Um, that's my favorite Daphne. You know, I, I've tried a lot of Daphnes in my yard. I love garden smell like most gardeners do. Um, I've killed quite a few Daphnes with water issues and soil. You got to be really careful with drainage on all Daphnes. This is the one to me, if you were going to do a Daphne, get eternal fragrance. That is one in my own yard. I'm getting nine months of flower out of. It blooms, it grows an inch, it blooms again, it grows an inch. We go through three or four flower cycles in one season on eternal fragrance so looks like a green kind of thick boxwood for shape you know maybe three feet tall four feet across i can shear it if you want to prune it but i'm going to walk out there starting in march and all the way till we get cool in the fall 
and I'm always going to see a little bit of flowers either open or on their way to being open. I think that's a, the longest blooming Daphne. We're waiting for our crop. We'll have a whole bunch of these. So don't come in here and yell at me this week because we don't have them yet, but we'll have a whole bunch of these. We go through usually three or 400 eternal fragrance Daphne in the spring and summer season. Hardy gardenia. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people know gardenias down in Southern California and the Southeast where they don't get frost and they can grow, you know, florist gardenias very easily. We can't have those up in Washington with frost. So we get quite a few hardy gardenias in. You know, these are plants that love fertilizer. They love acidity and they will bloom for you. If you've got them in a nice, sunny, well-drained spot and you feed them regularly, not once a spring, but this would be something I'd put two, three, four doses of a good rhododendron food on starting in March, then May, then midsummer at minimum, you know, every couple months, you'll keep them looking nice. And again, powerful fragrance and really nice flower when they, when they do open up in the summer months. Hypericum, um, it's not St. John's wort, not the ground cover, but there's some great shrubby hypericums now. If you like that summer and fall time, uh, some people call these floral berries. This is a really popular cut branch. A lot of folks are using in arrangements in their house to add a little color and texture. Uh, we get a number of different shrubby hyper comes in we've got one or two now but a lot of this comes in in june and july i could pick orange red black white pink any color berry that i want to get and, and i'm going to have that to enjoy august september and october they're always going to have the yellow flower but i can choose my berry on what i want to look at um, as far as the variety uh, potentilla you know or cinca foil that's one that takes a lot of abuse. That might be one of those bulletproof shrubs, but there's some great potentilla plants available. Whites, pinks, yellows, oranges, reds. That's kind of our color tone on potentilla. Easy to prune, easy to grow. That's something you'll get some easy flowering on in that late spring through summertime. Um, that's certainly one I'd look at adding. It's, it's, I think it's a different foliage, but I love orange and yellow, so that's an easy one for me. But uh, certainly an attractive plant to add into a nice sunny garden. Uh, Rose of Sharon is our hardy hibiscus. So some people call it Althea, Rose of Sharon. The point is that it's hardy hibiscus, not tropical hibiscus like Hawaii or Southern California, but hardy ones that we can actually grow up here in our gardens in Western Washington. We're not gonna get yellow, orange, and red but we're gonna have whites, lavenders, blues, pinks, a lot of those kind of pastel colors, and we can get single or double flowers. We get quite a bit of Rosa Sharon in here, just a few so far, but as they start to leaf out and get close to flowering, you know, you would probably see 12 different varieties of Althea here on the property in June, you know, as we start to bloom. This is one, like clockwork, I got one in my yard too, an old fashioned one, that we would always see a lot of flower power in that July and August time frame. Now, real quick, just a few summer bloomers for shade. Again, I'm tossing out hydrangea. We'll have a class here in a few weeks. If you want big round blue flowers or those flat lace cap flowers, there's nothing that's gonna bloom as long as a hydrangea. So don't forget about those uh, for summer months, but that, that's kind of, again, on its own little class. <clears throat> a couple other options. Calicanthus, or some people call that allspice. Very interesting flower, a lot of times kind of maroon or burgundy. It's a nice tall shrub. That would take some shade, some sun. You could honestly plant that just about anywhere. Even take a little bit of wet from time to time. Um, that may be an option to, to look at trying out. The, the, the snowberries or coral berries, these are called the symphiocarpus. You know, that's kind of like that floral berry we talked about for sun. If I'm interested in a bloom in July and an incredibly heavy berry crop for an attractive yard in that September, October, November timeframe, look at the different symphiocarpus. We get, we get galaxy and candy in and sell a lot of both of them. Those are ones that will see flower on the bees, love them in midsummer. But when those start to produce berries, they are absolutely covered, just like those pictures there um, for that fall, late summer, fall season. Summer Sweet, you know, is another fragrant one. We have some in now, we'll get more of these in, but that's a nice shrub. Again, I could grow this in sun and shade. 
This one takes some wet. It's a good option if you maybe don't have the best drainage, um, but clethra would be a good deciduous choice if you like that summer bloom with a little bit of fragrance. That's another great one for the butterflies um, and the pollinators as well. And then real quick, if we just do, you know, a little bit of shade, sometimes I kind of do a shade gardening class here in the summer and we'll do all this then too. But if we look at shade, you know, I'm looking at foliage, you know, I want variegation, I want big leaves, I want small leaves, I want it to look attractive all year. Yes, I love flowers, the hydrangeas and some other things we can pop in for color, but a shade garden can be very attractive, I think with a lot of really cool foliages as well. You know, contrast the different colors together. Everybody has green everywhere. Look at some white, some yellow, some lime. Some of the different shapes and sizes will give you that. All these plants will flower, you know, a season or here or there. But sometimes with shade, I like to look at the foliage more than anything and see if I can brighten up some of those areas as well. Now, if we look at <clears throat> some foliagey stuff more for sun, you know, barberries bloom, but this is prime barberry season right now. Look at the orange, the yellow, the red, the purple, the burgundy. Yes, they got little thorns on them, and sometimes they're not the, the easiest things to prune, um, but they're not as bad as you think. I use barberries in my yard, too, because the spring foliage, the summer color, the fall color is unbeatable. I mean, barberries are pretty indestructible. Yes, I get a nice flower here in spring, but these are ones that I, I purchased for the foliage. You know, evergreen, simple things, boxwood, Japanese holly, you know, again, good texture. A lot of these plants will have variegated cultivars. So if you don't want more green, look for the variegated ones, variegated English boxwood, something like the Japanese holly there. That's one called gold drop. I have that in my backyard. Instead of green, it really glows being yellow like that. You know, a lot of taller deciduous plants, elderberries are, are fabulous, black lace, black tower, there's all kinds of fun elderberries. Every year there seems to be a new variety of these coming out where I can have <clears throat> that super dark black purple foliage and nice flower as well. You can see in the picture, I can have something variegated like instant karma. <clears throat> I can have yellow if I want. We've got quite a good selection of, of different elderberries in right now. Some more evergreens for sun like osmanthus. You know, party lights gives me pure pink. These are fabulous looking when they flush out their leaves in the spring. I've got a pastel pink leaf on top of dark green. Euonymus, it's always a fun one to say, Euonymus. But Euonymus is a pretty good classification of shrubs. Some of these will be deciduous, like burning bush is a Euonymus. But evergreen Euonymus is really useful. I use these in all kinds of different places in sun in my yard because I like the variegation like the simplicity, it's an easy thing to go out and clip with the hedge clippers. You can turn it into any shape you like. But if I get upright ones like Silver King, Cholipo, Gold Spot, I can pick what variegation I like to have something that pops, or I can go low, you know, and pick something like Moonshadow or Blondie or some of the low varieties of Euonymus if I'm looking for a border plant that's evergreen and has very striking foliage. You know, twig dogwoods, I use these in my yard quite a bit. Great winter color on the stems, um, but I've also got attractive leaves if you look at your options. You know, we have green leafed twig dogwoods, which we would find native up here as well. But look at some foliage options like neon burst on the, on the side there. That would have yellow, bright yellow foliage with red stem, a really pretty plant I have in my front bank. Variegated sections like ivory halo, I've got that in a different area of the garden where, again, I can prune that very easily and keep it to a nice shape, but I've got a beautiful green with silver white colored leaf to enjoy all through the season. Dappled willow, you know, right now we're leafing out. Everybody comes in here in May and wants dappled willow because it's that green, white, and shrimp pink, the new leaves. You know, pink's not my favorite color, I'm always honest. But that's a pretty plant when it's leafing out here in the spring to early summer. That's a really, really bright pink if you like that color. And distillium, you know, that's an evergreen option uh, that's got a lot of choices down here. If I like a little growth color, those are evergreen, easy to grow. I can clip it into a hedge. Those bloom in the winter. But for foliage, I think a really attractive plant kind of as a, maybe a laurel substitute if you're not a big laurel fan. Smoke trees. 
you know, these are just leafing out right now, but you won't get probably as dark black purple as a purple smoke tree, you know, for a nice specimen or vice versa, get golden spirit. You can have a bright lime green gold one too. They get a pretty little, you know, kind of puffy smoke like bloom. <clears throat> but this is one I wouldn't mind if you just pruned it for the shrub and the foliage. It's a really striking plant out in the sun that will give me some nice foliage contrast. Nine barks, you know, we get a lot of nine barks in for color. I've got both these in my own yard and they're spectacular. You know, this time of year, leafing out orange or dark black purple or yellow. You know, there's a lot of good nine barks that do get a nice little flower on it there in my picture, um, but they've got great foliage and really cool bark. There's dwarf ones. You know, if I want to keep something down there, maybe four or five feet, or maybe you've got room for a nice specimen most of the nine barks will get six or eight feet tall and be an excellent background specimen with that, with that foliage color. We've got evergreens like Nandina. You know, we've got bonfire on there, Gulfstream, Burgundy wine. I could probably, Obsession, I could probably list off eight Nandinas we have out on the property, depending on what color you like. Do I want something kind of coppery, orangey? Do I like the purple? Do I like bright red? You know, these are easy to prune, easy to grow. You know, Nandine is one that's very drought tolerant. So if I keep these um, in the garden, I can shear them. And most of the new varieties I can keep, you know, three feet by three feet is very doable uh, with excellent foliage color. Now, if we look to shade last year for some foliage, you know, again, I'm looking for variegation. So if we look at things like Akuba, some people call this Japanese laurel, which I hate. Just call it a Cuba, please. Um, but I could choose how much yellow I want. Or if you like green, we've got green ones too. You know, Cuba's got big tropical looking leaves. It's plenty hardy up here to grow. <clears throat> you know, and that's probably one of the lowest light plants on the property. You know, I could have deep, dark shade in the very corner of my yard back there that hardly sees the daylight. A Cuba would make a great specimen plant to block that off and then I could plant some plants in front of it to garden as well. So look at some Akubas, we keep these around. Like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> boxwood will tend to grow in sun and shade. You know, the green one's not quite as well in deep dark shade, but the variegated ones will do just fine if we have, you know, just a few hours of daylight late in the day or a little bit of morning sun. And again, instead of green, I've got some color on there for, for a little bit of added interest. Castilium we mentioned before because that's one I can do shade or sun and get some attractive foliage on it as well. We saw some Nandinas, you know, in the sun section a second ago. If you like the white, the pink, the real light colors, Twilight is one we keep around that needs to be in part shade. If I have that out in full sun, it'll get a little tired in late summer. But if I locate it in a nice shady spot, that's got great foliage again on a small little compact three foot evergreen is easy to maintain. Uh, Japanese holly and box honeysuckle, you know, again, not deep dark shade, but those morning sun or just a little bit of afternoon, you know, great foliage and filler plants. You know, those would be good options for a little foundation planting, something you can clip if you want to. Um, there's quite a few varieties of both those plants out there in the trade. If you want something low, if I want tall and narrow, if I want something big and bushy, you know, we can find some different varieties of box honeysuckle or Japanese holly that make great evergreen shrubs. And maybe a couple one you haven't seen, the Divalaria. Uh, we're down on these right now. We'll have some more coming in. But this is a plant here to me. Yes, it gets a little bit of flower on. You can see on the, the orange one there, the same bloom on all of them. They're named by color for the foliage. So I can have one that turns orange, one that goes red. There's some other flavors out there as well. We typically have orange and red around, but really pretty leaves. It's a deciduous plant, so nothing in the, in the winter months, but during the spring, summer, fall, really attractive spring growth color and excellent fall color as well. So certainly something, that, something to consider. <clears throat> and that's a big foliage plants. You know, we talked about a Cuba, you know, north side of the house, deep, dark shade. You know, there's some great Japanese Aurelias or Fatsias um, that we can grow as a nice tall specimen plant. We've got quite a few of these here in our gardens on the property. We're happy to show you. But something like camouflage, you know, will give me big, bold, <clears throat> you know, tropical-ish foliage. 
but I'll have the yellow lime green splashed on dark green. Spider web, we just got a bunch of these in, all kinds of white variegation on that one. Uh, we get a number of different fatsias in and dark green, plain ones too, if you like your green, um, but certainly a plant to consider if you're looking for a taller evergreen that you can use in the background in, in a nice deep dark shade situation. This is another one, maybe a few, I have camouflage in my yard, got nipped a little bit this winter, but we just pruned the tip of it off and off it's already growing again. So this is not one we would lose in the cold. Maybe just have to do a little bit of spring pruning. Uh, Mahonia hybrids, you know, we looked at Oregon grape, our native one earlier, lots of cool hybrid Mahonias to utilize in the shade as well. Lots of fall, winter, early spring bloom, but those would be evergreen. That one picture there is one called Charity. If you're looking for a big, you know, eight to 10 foot specimen shrub for that half day sun shade garden. That would get you keep your hummingbirds happy for a good chunk of the winter when those are flowering. And then you saw different osmanthus, you know, party lights has pink. Goshiki is an older variety that would give me all that beautiful yellow variegation on top of green. That's another one easy to prune. Looks like holly, but it's not holly. We're not gonna get all the berries, uh, berries on there like we do with English holly. So that's a speed shrub show. I probably barely made it. Oh, I got three minutes to 11. Give me one second here. If I can find my cursor, I'm gonna stop sharing. You can see our website on there. You can always access a lot of the information on there. The class handouts on there if you didn't get a hold of that. And then obviously you can, you can email us anytime if you got some questions. I had some fun ones after Maples yesterday uh, from lots of different places that aren't here, but it's always fun to kind of talk plants with everybody. Let me stop share. Oh, there's Nicole. She came back. Um, so real quick, um, you know, we always do class discounts for our local customers here. Uh, if you're not local around here, you should move here. We got a beautiful climate. But uh, sunny side, we got 20% off all shrubs. We made this real easy. So if you can guess, I don't know, Nicole, is that probably put about two thirds of the property on 20% off this coming week? So Take advantage of the sale. That's a pretty generous discount from the ownership here. Um, so on, it could be anything. We're not going to probably say no, including rhodes, azaleas, hydrangeas, anything that you'll come to me and say, that's a shrub. We'll hit the button and grab you, grab you 20% off this week. So it's a good, good time to shop. Um, just a heads up, um, I'll be here next weekend working, of course, because I'm here every weekend this time of year, but no classes next weekend in two weeks. Um, I mentioned it yesterday, we come back with kind of one of the more fun festival classes. Uh, Saturday, I think it's the 23rd, yeah, 23rd Saturday, two weeks from yesterday is roadie day. So I think it's a fun day here at the nursery. We do a class just like this online, but we'll have a trust show here. So we have the Pilchuck chapter of the roadie society uh, come down. If you like rhododendrons, you gotta stop by here between 10 or two, because there is tables and there is hundreds of flowers and vases and beer bottles and all kinds of fun other devices they, they put them in. But we'll see roadie flowers, it'll knock your socks off. This is stuff that is bred by experts, geneticists, people that have been doing this for 40, 50 years of their life and showing off, look what I have in my yard kind of thing. So there's some really fun flowers down here. Um, roadies, azaleas and deciduous azaleas, we'll have a special class for that on the 23rd. On the 24th is Sunday, We'll come back with colorful climbers. So if you want to join us, if you like everything clanging and climbing and doing all that stuff, we go vertical with the vine class on Sunday at 11 a.m. of the 24th. I'll be doing that as well. Okay. So that's a lot of talking, Nicole. Let's see if we got some questions here. Um, yeah, I was going to mention that those roadie society experts, if you've got something in your yard that maybe you inherited and you have no idea what variety, they're really good at that too. I love the game stump the experts, whether it's with our experts here in the nursery or um, the roadie society chapter that comes down. So if you're, you know, there's like Trevor said, so many varieties, it's really cool to see all the unique flowers that they bring I mean, down. Put, put, put it this way they'll start bringing down their plants this week on Tuesday. They'll bring a couple hundred down. We, we kind of help them out as a nonprofit and sell some roadies for them so they can raise money for the club, which is a great cause. So we'll start having them this week. And I will tell you right now, the staff around here uh, probably takes about 20% of them home. I know I bought five last year and some others for presents for family members, but there's some plants 
that you probably won't see anywhere else when they drop off their collection stuff, really high quality gallon rhododendrons. They're not super expensive um, and certainly worth a look when you're down here in the next couple of weeks, let alone that Saturday, we'll, we'll have a bunch of them as well. Well, and you know, if people like you and some of, you know, our, <laughs> our staff that's been gardening for like yeah. ever, if they're like, oh, that's something Look I gotta have. That. I gotta have one of those, <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, oh, wait, maybe I need one of those too. Um, I love how, as you go through these, you're like, I have one of those in my garden, one of those. I'm like, how much space do you have? It's incredible how many things you say right. are in your yard that. I, I have quite a bit and it's pretty packed. I, I wish uh, now if I add anything, I have to take something out and give it to somebody or I hate sending things to the compost heap in the sky. So I don't try to do that, but uh, yeah, there's always this, containers, this, right? Well, this, this will be an interesting, exactly more yeah. containers is my problem. <laughs> this will be an interesting year to be honest for a lot of us, um, whether we're plant geeks or not, it really doesn't matter. There's a lot of winter damage with the cold we had after Christmas. So I'm going to, maybe have a few places I can try something new because I'm like, I'm not going to do one of those again. Let me try something else this time. So right. Love I'll that. have some new ones to try for 2023's class. There you go. There you go. So speaking of winter damage and, you know, pruning things back. Um, so we have a, without diving into pruning, because it's such a big topic, yeah. but um, there was one, there's a few specific kind of shrub pruning yeah. questions. Um, one specifically about Ceanothus that yeah. kind of got hit in the winter and how yeah. hard can you prune that back in order to save it. Well, 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 I'll tell you what, let's just take all of this in one big question umbrella, because I mentioned a bunch of this during the class, because I try to always be honest with people. We could have taken the Mexican orange, we could take Cenothus. I mean, you saw me mention six, 10, 12 different shrubs during that slideshow. All of it, including mine, got damaged. We can't do anything about Mother Nature. Um, I can't tell you how bad it is unless I see it. So what I'm going to say to all these questions are this, you need to walk out there, take your fingernail, your pruner, whatever your favorite little nicking device is. Look at the wood. That's all that matters. The foliage could be black like mine to the ground. If I find some green on that bottom trunk, I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to cross my fingers. I'm going to put some food down and I'm going to say, please come back and join me in 2022. Um, that's the best I can tell you. You're some things are going to, you know, I, I teach pruning class and probably some of you are at it. And I have the one third rule. You're going to break that every single time when we're talking about trying to rejuvenate something. To me, it's worth a try. You know, before you pitch it in the garbage and say, I got to go buy another plant at Sunnyside. That's not a bad thing either. But I'm going to cut it back to the point where I have green. I'm going to cross my fingers. I'm going to feed it. And I'm going to hope it comes back up. Some of them will. I mean, it's going to be really easy. Other stuff. Don't come down here and curse at me like that. Trevor told me if I cut it off, it's going to grow in a month. I can't tell you without looking at it because I'm, I'll tell you right now with Escalonia, I'm probably worried than most things. I've seen some pictures come in. I'm like, look, you could cut it off the ground and, and see what happens. But I do not think that is going to regrow this year. A lot of other stuff, other things I mentioned, absolutely, I think are going to pop back up like the Mexican orange, maybe some hebes. I'm hoping for that one in my yard. Um, but try. I mean, that's what I'm saying is just give it a try. Break the pruning rule, cut it way back, cross the fingers and toes, and we'll see what happens. Mother nature. It's a gamble sometimes. Just got to yeah. do what we can, right? Yeah. So excluding the winter damage conversation, um, quick pruning tips for uh, specifically an edgewardia and a mock okay. orange. Okay. So again, I would go straight back to all my rules. We just talked about breaking the one through rule. So forget all that I said. But if we're going to prune a healthy plant, um, we're not going to go more than one third. And I always swear by this rule, prune after bloom. If I had 100 people in front of me like we used to here, I'd make everybody say it three times. If you prune after flowering, you are not going to lose. So if my mock orange blooms, cut it back at that point, let it regrow for the summer. Now I set flower buds and I got bloom in 2023. If I walk out there next December or January when it's got no leaves on it, and I cut it in half, it'll grow, but I've probably cut off almost all my flowers. So look at specific plants. You saw it in one of the slides, old wood bloom, new wood bloom, and pruning after flowering. Those are the two keys to all this shrub discussion, uh, whatever plant it is. If you don't know, ask, send an email. I got a, whatever it is, I got a quince in my yard. Is that an old wood bloomer or a new wood bloomer? We can answer that in two seconds. 
You can probably find it online too, but keep that in mind is as your timing of pruning comes up after bloom is always best. And then how much safety is always a third. We're going to, again, break it a little bit here and there, but, but uh, always safe to go a third. So you mentioned uh, fertilizing a few times during this, you know, after yeah. cutting back winter damage yeah. or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, what kind of fertilizer do you recommend for most of these colorful shrubs? Well, it, you know, honestly, anything is not going to hurt one or another. Um, you know, if I've got roadie food around, that's going to cover probably 99% of anybody's landscape. You know, nothing mines a little bit of acidity. Maybe lilac is the one plant we don't want to put roadie food on. We would get more of a rose flower food like roses the same way. Um, but I could have tree shrub food. I could have roadie food. I could have all purpose. To me, as long as it's organic, we're not going to ever burn. We can put it down and be totally safe. And it's not going to hurt anything. I mean, if you came down here today and said, I want to prune it, I watch the class, I want to do some feeding and get everything back to health. What do I buy? I'm probably just going to say, you know what, to be safe, let's go get you an all-purpose bag. Or we have one that's called tree and shrub food. It's not much for bloom, but it's going to get you that growth, which would be phase one. It's going to help recover with the nitrogen and get us some growth. So buy an organic granular one way or another but really any of those five, you're not going to hurt much. Roadie food, you know, someone else asked, what's in your garage? Yes, I have a roadie food. Yes, I have frozen flower food and a vegetable food. Those three cover pretty much everything in my yard. I very rarely go down and buy something specific unless it's a, for my dahlias or one of my many plant addictions I need something different for. But that covers pretty much everything at my place. Frozen flower, I want bloom on that lilac. Rhododendron food, I want the acidity for my broadly things. Love that. We love efficiency, right? You don't want you 20 go. different things. You don't have to come to the store. I won't be right. upset if we go to your garage and we see one yeah. bag of every type of organic fertilizer. Great if you do, but yeah. you don't have to have that many. <laughs> good. good, really good answer. Um, so we, we kind of joked about growing things in containers. Um, you know, kind of a generalized thought. What Can you grow most of these in containers? You yeah. know, I mean, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, you can grow any plant in a container. I mean, that's an easy thing. The problem, the, the question to you is going to be how long do you want it to be in that container and how large is the container? Um, you know, I can't grow a mock orange, some of the larger stuff we looked at, you know, yeah, I could grow it in a pot for a few years, but I'm not going to be able to grow something like that permanently, you know, even in maybe a half whiskey barrel is probably not quite big enough. Um, if I, you know, most gardeners to me have 12 inch or 18 inch, maybe two foot pots, you know, I could grow any shrub in there for a number of years. It's going to let you know when it's getting tired, you're going to water it. It's not going to absorb much. And you're probably going to go, that just doesn't look quite as nice as it has before. Okay. There's the hint. I got to get you transplanted into a bigger pot or put in the garden at that point. Gotcha. Um, speaking of, you know, planting things, what about, you know, this is not necessarily in containers, but under trees, established yep. big trees yep. using yep. some of these shade shrubs. Do you yep. need to be yep. mindful of like root systems or are there yep. some shrubs that are better under yeah. trees? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, a, we talk a lot about that in the shade class we'll be doing this summer, but we'll do a little preview today. So, um, if I'm gardening underneath established trees, A, I'm assuming you don't want to damage your trees. So no, we're not going to get a chainsaw out and cut a bunch of roots out, tear it all apart, and then move it back in. You know, Mother Nature is going to tell you where you can plant your new plants. You're going to have to poke around and find somewhere where I don't have large established roots. Don't mind. It's not going to hurt the tree if you're digging out little pockets of fibrous roots. But I'm not looking to cut giant roots to make room for my perennial or my shrub. We want to make sure the tree's happy too. So find some spots you can plant, dig as much as you can out, amend the soil for sure, and absolutely mulch when you're done. The problem with trees up, you know, I'm speaking for our neighbor neck of the woods up here, but with all the evergreens, that's the problem is large root systems, established dug fir, western red cedar, all the things we have native up here. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of root system there. And they are taking every single little bit of water that comes down. You walk out today, we get a pretty good rainstorm. Not much is getting through that tree and into your new plants. So the point of me saying all this is, yes, you can do it. There's fabulous drought tolerance selections. You know, if I was going to throw you a couple from that show, look at epimediums, look at hellebores, look at Lukotha ways, a great choice for dry shade or part shade. 
there's plenty of options out there. My Oregon grape, I mean, I can go on and on, but drought tolerant doesn't mean I plant it and I walk away. That tree is not going to help you water that plant. So you've got to mulch and you really have to watch the water the first couple summers. You know, up here, I would normally say, just go out and watch it, you know, when we don't rain, you know, June to September. I'd tack another month or two on either end of that in your situation because it can rain in March and April. Again, not much of it's getting down to the soil surface. If it's looking dry, we've got to irrigate those areas. Once they get root systems going, they'll all cohabitate and be friends. Not one thing's going to beat another one. Um, and they'll be happy long term. But for a few years, we've really got to watch the watering in, in, the, in the dry season. And for those of us that are a little bit on the newer side to gardening, usually all that information is on the plant tags, right? Like if they can tolerate drier conditions or wetter. You know, absolutely. Or, you know, I, I think it's still up from last year. You know, we'll be talking about dry shade is a major topic um, in our shade class we do in the summer months up here. You could probably go back and look at last year's class, punch up the handout because on my handout I did, it's got lists of all that stuff shrubs for dry shade, perennials for dry shade, all the things you can do. It's absolutely doable. You know, you can't have everything in there. I'm probably going to have a tough time growing a hydrangea, you know, underneath the cedar tree, unless I really water the daylights out of it because those love water, but there's lots of other options that I could have luck with as well. So good yeah the plant tags as well as you know the experts there in the nursery are great resources to yeah. use um you know any questions that you have you know don't be afraid to ask or read you know well well, well and, and let me say this because this is a hard one with with this tree discussion um make the answer your the easiest answer i think most gardeners come with is oh well sweet let me just buy two foot of fresh three-way soil and bury that whole garden so i can plant in it that is not the answer for your tree. I cannot bury surface roots like that. And I cannot put soil up on the trunk of established trees. You're gonna lose your tree. Um, so be really careful. Yes, I can add some soil. Yes, I can mulch it. All that's in play, but I am not gonna take an old cedar that's been there for years and go, sweet, I want a garden on it. Let's put three feet of new soil around the whole thing, make a new berm and plant it. Sometimes you might get away with it, but, but you, you really got to be careful up by the trunks. And a lot of these trees need surface roots. That's part of their part of their process. Really good advice. Yeah. Before you realize it, maybe you're in a rough situation. So just <laughs> yeah. don't do it. My tree is declining. It's been there for 50 years. Oh, well, yeah. can't put a foot of soil up the trunk. That's not 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 going to work. So yeah heartbreaking to see those old established things disappear. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, zones and hardiness. Can you give a quick breakdown? Um, you know, if I'm in zone eight, am I only looking for things on tags that say zone eight or, you know, can you kind of explain that a little bit for us? <laughs> well, this is a tough one for me because um, I think if you looked up right now, if you're anywhere near us, you punch in your zip code, you go to any plant website, USDA, Washington, WSDA, any of it, What's my hardiness zone? And it's probably gonna say your zone eight, zone eight A, zone eight B. <clears throat> That's all the stuff that got nuked this winter. So if you wanna play safe, I would go zone seven and every number I go down is hardier. So zone one, we could have up in Nome, Alaska, like 50 below zero. Then we go up 10 degrees every zone. So seven to me gets me in that zero to 10 degrees range. I start going into eight, 10 to 20, what happened this winter you know i don't know you know none of us can ever say global warming we're never going to get the single digits again i could never tell you that i don't have a magic crystal ball for down the road <clears throat> but to, i guess to answer the question if you want to be safe i don't care what your computer says or the western gardening book or what some people might tell you if you want to be safe i'd stick with zone seven if you are anywhere around here if you go zone eight then you're like me, probably replacing three hebes this winter and another plant of this and a bit of sporum and a lot of the other stuff that's really cool. If I do it again, guess what I'm doing? I'll go buy another pot because then I can grow it in a pot, enjoy it in the yard. We're going to get cold, sweet. You can go hang in the garage for the week and I'll throw you back out next week kind of thing. Yeah, me too. I think we all do that. Oh, it's going to make it because they're so cool. I want this. And then you yeah. watch it crash. And week, okay. week later is like, whoop, should have put that in the garage. I think Less I said that like 
six yeah. times this winter myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, shifting gears. So um, talking about transplanting, uh, are most of these shrubs, we've got a question specifically about beautyberry, but can these shrubs be transplanted fairly easily as long as you can manage them in size? When do you do it? Exactly. When they're young, absolutely. Anything can be transplanted around shrubs. Or I've moved all kinds of shrubs around my yard. I don't like it there. I think I'd like it here better. Alice Munn, I, mean, I do it all the time. My, drives my wife crazy, honestly. If she was here, she'd be like, mm-hmm, drives me crazy. So we can move them around. Um, I would really try to talk you out of doing it right now is gonna be the problem. If we're gonna transplant something and have near 100% success, it's gotta be during the dormant season. I mean, I want you out there like late November to first of March, you know, those four months in the winter when things are not actively growing, everything is putting on growth right now. Unless you just put it in, this year, last year is probably okay, and you can take everything with you. Um, I think you'd be okay doing that still. Um, I would wait till fall if it's something that's been there a long time. Let it go dormant, let the first frost happen, and then we could excavate it up and, and relocate it. Take as much root <clears throat> as you can, especially with evergreen things in particular. If it's deciduous, sometimes you can get away with a little less root ball. And I would never tell you to go out and bare root it and expect it to do much. Sometimes you can get away with that, I have, but but uh, take as much root as you can with it that's physically manageable without breaking yourself. How's that? <laughs> and if, if this is something that's on your radar or project list to do, don't be afraid to reach out and ask, a, yeah. ask us questions. It's always easier to get all the information before you do it and feel like you're ready and successful before you do it. And then you're just... Uh, and, and, and I might add one thing to that. So let's say, I don't know who's asking, Mrs. Jones just asked that question and she's like, I cannot have that burying my front walkway any longer. Okay, prepare for the move if you really want to save it. If it was me, a lot of times, if I know I'm going to try to relocate something that's been there for a while, I'll walk out, say, first of August, and I'm not going to chop right against the trunk, but I'll take my shovel and I'll say, okay, I think I could probably move a little three foot circle of earth with me when we move it. So I'll take my shovel and I'll step on it. And all I'm gonna do is cut the circle around there, sever some of those root systems, okay? I'm not gonna dig it up. I'm not gonna turn soil over. I'm not moving it, but I'm just gonna chop in a circle because then that winter, I've told that plant, I just cut your roots. You started to regrow some easier roots. Now I might have a little easier time to, to move it as well that winter. That may help you too. Smart. So if you're transplanting and you're also thinking about pruning, is do you need to be mindful about what order you do those two? Yeah. Well, if, if we're talking in the winter time, and again, this is going to be a hard one to answer. So again, old wood bloom, new wood bloom. So I'd be real careful about cutting something back super hard. You're not going to get bloom next year if you do it um, at the wrong time. Now, let's just for, say we I don't care about bloom for a year one way or another. I got to get this plant moved. Um, yes, absolutely. Go ahead and do it that way. I would prune it back to make it easier. Move it. I just, you know, say you did that to a lilac next winter. You chopped it off. You moved it. It's going to grow. It's not going to hurt the plant, but it's going to shoot up growth. Now I'll set flower buds and I'll see you in 2024, another year later. You're not going to get the flowering that spring. Okay, good to know. Um, shifting gears, you know, we were talking about crepe myrtles. Um, mm -hmm. Do they tolerate wet soil? How do they do? I, no, I, I really wouldn't do crepe myrtle in wet. You know, that's kind of a hot, dry, good, good drought tolerant style plant. Um, I wouldn't do super wet with that at all. I mean, you want to keep that a little bit higher and drier for sure. Um, it's not that it can't get water. I'm not saying that, but if I got hard pan clay, Puddling, puddling water in the winter months, not not a good spot for a crepe myrtle. You'll probably lose it. All right, good to know. So uh, last question, kind of generalized. So how, where do you suggest starting? Do you start with kind of, you know, your, because uh, I, I ask this all the time because I'm really yeah. curious. Yeah. Um, you know, you start with like your sun conditions and then yeah. go to like what you like visually. How do you, where yeah. do you start? Well, if, if you were going to get started, I mean, well, obviously down here, we're happy to help you. I mean, you bring in some pictures, you doesn't have to be a fancy landscape plan. Take a piece of notebook paper. Here's my house. I got a bed right here. I got this plan in. I'm not sure what it is. Whatever. Take pictures of them. You know, we can help accent what you already have. You know, let's start with that by picking out some things you like, not that we like. There's all kinds of choice around here. And I would hope we have we have something that's going to catch your fancy we can add in there. But yes, the, the, 
the vital information to me would be how much sun am I getting? Okay. What else is around it? Um, you know, would be another thing. How's your soil? You know, I would probably tell you, dig down a foot or two. When do you hit hard pan? Do you not have it? Thank you. If you don't, um, you know, there's a lot of things I would investigate a little bit because again, you know, nothing's worse than coming down here and buying 20 shrubs and the yard looks great. And then three years later, you're like, why is everything crashing? Because we got the wrong plant, the wrong shrub in the wrong place. So um, I would encourage you to come down. I mean, you could do a lot of this online, you know, looking at options, you know, and say, Ooh, that looks really cool. Maybe bring a list with you, you know, go to the websites. I talked about Monrovia has thousands of plants on their, on their website. You could probably get lost for a couple of days on there. Um, there's a lot of other ones as well. We are like, all these things catch my eye. Here's my yard. What, what do you think would work for me? You know, and we'll be honest with you. Like, Hey, that's a great plant not the right spot for you, but how about we look at this because it's similar. It would look close to that, but that would thrive in that same location. Um, I would, you know, that's probably part of it is picking things out, you know, and then again, maybe you're a, a new gardener, which is awesome. You know, we've got a lot of new gardeners the last couple of years or people that have rediscovered gardening, you know, look at what you have, you know, it's again, it's your yard, not mine. I love this tree. I want to keep it. What could I put around it to create that layering effect, you know, tree, shrub border plant is it mixing some perennials in you know again it's what's what what catches your eye you know i love yellow foliage period i got it all over my place i think it's bright i think it's cheery i talked to half the customers here and be like dude i it looks like it needs food to me i cannot stand things with yellow on them it's totally your up to your taste so we find something a little bit different Great, great advice. I love that. You know, just in case you don't know, we don't carry anything in the nursery that's not going to survive here in our conditions. We don't, we want you to go home and have beautiful plants for years and years and years, like Trevor mentioned. We don't want to send you home with something that's going to crash a few years later or something that you're just not going to be successful with. We love plants. We want to see them survive. We want to see you succeed. Um, so we're really just here to, to help you so that you enjoy gardening as much as we all do. Um, mm -hmm. So come down. The weather's turning around, you know, I mean, minus today, um, but it's a great. I still got my shorts on, so let's go. <laughs> You're committed at this point. Um, it's a great time of year to be outside, see what's blooming and just, you know, add some happiness back. I think we've all been shut up inside for too long that it's nice to have some weather to get outside, enjoy the fresh air and, and see what beautiful things are around us. So come down, visit, say hello. Um, hopefully we'll see you down in two weeks, like Trevor mentioned, for that roadie system. Society. It's a really cool event we hold every year. Hopefully you can come down and check out some of these flowers um, and join us online for the class that morning as well, too. So we appreciate your time today and we yeah. hope to see you again later. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again here in a couple of weeks.